Hello, everyone. My name is Kat Oriel with Forbes Breaking News, and today I'm here with Jay Jacobs, who is the chair of the New York State Democratic Committee, as well as the chair of the Nassau County Democratic Party. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So it is a special election day in Long Island. Voters are headed to the poll as we speak to replace ex-Congressman George Santos. So what's the reaction and sentiment on the ground today? And is the snowstorm having any impact on the turnout? Well, I think so. I, I mean, uh, turnout in the morning hours in 2022 was about 48,000. The comparative time here uh, this year was 13,000. So while we did very well with early vote, and absentee ballots uh, that we collected before the camp, uh, the election day started, and I'm I'm happy we did that. Um, it, it's a bit sluggish in the morning. Now we do expect it to pick up. So the snow stopped at about one o'clock, and um, what I'm hearing is that our voters are coming out. The roads are finally getting cleared. So I think the rest of the day you'll see a, a steady flow. Related to that, how vital was early voting? What were the results from over the weekend? Yeah, well, that was very, very vital. I mean, it was it just coincidentally and, and uh, a little bit ironic, I guess, that uh, when we were contemplating this special election, and I was hoping for the February 13th date, and I had, you know, made it clear that I requested uh, that date, you never knowing what the governor would choose. I said to our team, I mean, I had a whole bunch of people assembled. I said, you got to remember something. It's the middle of February. We could pick a date that's going to have a blizzard. Uh, so we got to get early voting done and we got to get absentee ballots like we've never done before. And everybody did just that. And lo and behold, we haven't had snow like this in three years. Careful what you put out into the universe, I guess. That's so, true. That's so true. right. So former Congressman George Santos managed to flip this seat from blue to red back in 2022. So what makes you confident that Democrats are going to be able to flip it back the other way? Well, let's remember something. He wasn't George Santos. I mean, he, he took the ride. He got elected. Uh, I'll, I'll give him that. Uh, 2022 was a, a, a unique year. And everybody's got to recognize it. We were in the midst of a gubernatorial campaign with a very tough gubernatorial opponent like we hadn't had before, both uh, in terms of popularity and um, his financing. Uh, he outspent our gubernatorial candidate that year uh, at the end of the campaign. So, you know, it was really very competitive. And then you had bail reform, the issues of crime. It was uh, President Biden's first um, midterm election. All of the things that came together to make it a very tough uh, election, on top of which, if you'll remember, we had redistricting here in New York State. George Santos did not have a primary. Uh, his opponent, Robert Zimmerman, did, but because of redistricting, that primary took place at the very end of August. So Zimmerman completely wiped out all of his campaign money, right? And, and then started and only had about nine, 10 weeks to run a campaign that George Santos had an additional eight, nine, 10 weeks before that to you know build up more money and, and um, you know, work the district. So, you know, it wasn't exactly the same. And I, I think the circumstances right now, as well as the political environment right now, are very different. And I think you're going to see a different result. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit more about that. What do you think exactly was learned from the 2022 midterms? And exactly how are you confident that things are going to change this upcoming election? Well, as I mentioned, number one, I don't think we're going to have a primary at the end of August this time. Um, I can't say we're not going to have primaries, uh, uh, you know, in some of the districts, but that's going to be very different. Um, the other thing I, I would say to you is now we're getting national attention. So you see, even by this campaign with Tom Swazi against uh, Mazi Pillow, uh, the amount of outside money that has flowed into this district, and we expect will be flowing into our competitive uh, targeted districts here in New York, is different than we've ever seen before. And you can do a lot with, with money because that helps you with the messaging. You know, Robert Zimmerman, when he ran in this very same district in 2022, he did not have that benefit. People took New York for granted. And New York is a blue state as the whole state goes. But on a district by district basis, you make a big mistake by assuming everybody's blue. Because yes, the city of New York is very blue, dark blue. But um, Long Island is, is purple and sometimes, you know, tints a little red. Uh, and the same thing with upstate New York. So, you know, we have to pay that kind of attention. And I've been arguing that and I'm really delighted that now, you know, uh, that's what we're seeing in terms of the support. And it could not uh, be any better from uh, leader Hakeem Jeffries and the team at the DCCC. It's been really excellent. So now I wanted to talk about the candidate, um, former rep Tom Swazi. So he already served in the seat. Why is he the right person to be able to flip it back? And why is he, you know, the right person for the job right now? 
Well, I never wanted him to leave that seat to begin with. You know, he, he, he and I have been close friends for years. I was with him in the very beginning when he ran for county executive. Uh, and uh, our families are close friends. Uh, I wanted to wring his neck when he decided uh, to run uh, in a primary against the governor, Kathy Hochul. And I told him that. And I and uh, that was one of our, you know, um, uh, big points where we split ways. Uh, and I supported Kathy Hochul because I thought she was the right person. But Tom had served as an excellent member of Congress. He was on Ways and Means. He was respected by colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Um, he's a guy that likes to get things done. He's very personable. And on top of that, he's a great campaigner. He raises money, you know, like nobody does. I, I, you know, I've watched him do it sometimes and you could, uh, you know, raise your eyebrows. Can't imagine how he, how he actually says the things he says in terms of getting money out of people, but he does and people like him. So they, they invest in him. So I think he's an excellent public official. He's been an excellent congressman. And I think he'll be one again. And I think, by the way, sending him to the House of Representatives is going to send a, a really uh, stark message to uh, Speaker uh, Mike Johnson about not only the practicality of losing a vote, but what this election means for all of the things that he's been against and some of the things he's been in favor of. I, I think Tom Swasey's election will help set that straight. Mm -hmm. I do want to go back to that. But first, I do want to ask you about Mozzie Phillips. So, you know, there's a few more hours until the ballots close. Hopefully people will see that before they head to the polls. But from your perspective, why is she not the right person for this job in your view? And that being said, if she are, is to be elected, would you still be willing to work with her? Well, Mozzie Pillip, um had demonstrated, have you watched anybody watch the debate? She only um, agreed to one debate. And I understand why. If you watch that debate and you're and you've got any open mind whatsoever, you know, in other words, you're not already, uh, you know, died in the wall uh, for her party. Um, you take a look at that debate. You can't vote for this lady. Um, she does not know the issues. She doesn't have the answers. She became unhinged several times, in, you know, uh, actually walking across and, you know, confronting Tom Swazi and shouting at him uh, because she was upset with the fact that she didn't have answers. Uh, she says, uh, trust me, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how I'm going to get this done. Trust me, I'm a doer. He's just a talker. I'm going to get it done. She said that again and again and again. I never heard of anything so ridiculous coming out of a candidate's mouth, uh, uh, particularly a candidate that when you say, trust me, you know, hasn't made any deposits into the bank account of trust, you know, uh, yet uh, hasn't done anything uh, yet uh, uh, as an elected official. She served for two years, hardly ever spoke in the legislature and never once voted in any direction other than with her Republican colleagues. So she's wholly unqualified. Um, I don't think that she she is going to be able to get to Congress and, and with that demeanor, what we saw in that debate, be able to work with people, certainly not across the aisle. Um, as the Democratic chair here in Nassau County, look, I'm courteous and will be polite to, to everyone. I'll be polite to her. I, I am, you know, have a good cordial and positive relationship with my Republican counterpart here. And, uh, you know, we go out to dinners and we talk, we disagree about a lot of things, but the things that we can work on, uh, we do. So, you know, that's always going to be my approach. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you uh, if you haven't voted and you're thinking of voting, you don't know what to do, watch that debate. That'll decide it. Now, going back to what you were discussing before, do you think this will be a bellwether for 2024 in November? You know, what will the implications of this race be for the rest of the nation, especially the Democrats' chances of taking back the House and Biden's um, chances of maintaining the White House? Well, I, I don't think that, you know, winning or losing this race is going to make the difference as to what or, or, or tell us clearly what's going to happen in November, because so much is going to happen between now and November. And, and you know, all these districts, while similar to some, you know, there are differences, uh, both demographically, organizationally with the various parties and, and, and everything. And of course, you know, I don't expect a snowstorm in November. But, you know, what I would say to you um, is that it certainly will um, give one of the two parties momentum going into this election season and bragging rights frankly again whether that turns out to be accurate you know we'll see but um uh, i sure would rather win this i think it sends a message to the republicans you know they they've really gone over the top on their um uh the mi the migrant issue you know blaming 
uh, Swazi for crime and for letting all the migrants in. If you watch their ads, you, you'd think that Tom Swazi had a pickup truck down on the Mexican border and was bringing in you know, all the migrants through that hole in the wall. I mean, it was actually crazy what they're saying, but that's what they do. Republicans' playbook is the same. Every single election, it never changes. You either scare the voters or you make them angry. And if you're really good and you can get away with it, do both. That's all they do. And the truth, not a limitation. You know, don't don't worry about it. Just do what you got to do. And that's what they did here. And if that didn't work, I think it sends a message to them that they better come up with some more credible arguments and tell people what you're going to do for them rather than scare them about uh, and telling them what they, they, they want the people to believe the Democrats did to them, you know, which is pure nonsense. I guess we got to hope there won't be a snowstorm in November. Got to be careful what you're putting out into the universe there. But um, right. lastly, I do want to ask you about the presidential election overall. So tell me about President Biden's re-election campaign. Do you support it? Is he getting a lot of support there in Long Island? Or would you have liked to see a more robust primary? No, I, I, I'm happy with President Biden. Look, you know, I, I don't understand people sometimes. I'm in this business a long time. And I talk to voters, I, I talk to friends of mine who happen to be Republican and, uh, you know, are not supportive of Biden. And I talk to people that are Democrats at times, oh, he, you know, he's old, why can't we get somebody younger, et cetera. And, you know, I was with the president last week. Uh, I spent uh, a few minutes talking to him. I can't say that, you know, we're, we're best of friends, we're just not. I just, you know, was at an event with him. I've seen him several times uh, over the course of this, uh, the past uh, couple of years. I, I, I knew him before when he was vice president. Um, but. You know, he's on his game. This business that this guy doesn't know stuff or doesn't have a memory. When we talked, he, he was up to speed on the third congressional. He knew, you know, the details about the district. He asked me specific questions. And, and um, you know, you, 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 while his voice, you know, will sound older, you know, and he was on his third appearance, having not only made, I suspect, at least three speeches, but also talked to the, uh, the, the folks who were at each of those events and then came to the, the last one where I was. Um, I have to tell you, this is this is a guy who, um, by all accounts, as far as I can tell, is is as sharp as as they, as they come. It's just it's just a fiction what's being sold. On top of which, then you take a look at what this guy has gotten done. Let me tell you something. Uh, you know, Donald Trump. They they say, oh, he was great. He did such a great job as president. What did he do? Please tell me. What did the man do? He passed one piece of legislation, a tax bill right? That put us hugely into debt by giving money away to corporations and rich people and taking away the salt deduction from states like New York. That's the state and local tax deduction that we always had here. So, you know, he did that. He put, you know, uh, uh, tariffs on China and that caused the farmers to lose income. And then, of course, he really was so magnificent in his handling of COVID that, you know, um, he was telling us his, his cure was uh, you know, put disinfectant into your veins or, or go under ultraviolet because that's the way to solve it. Never mind, he first told us there was no problem at all. Nobody was going to get it. So I, I don't know. I see this president passing bills in a tough Congress, bipartisan fashion, the chips bill, the um, the infrastructure, $1.3 trillion in infrastructure spending, you know, pulled us out of the COVID um uh, pandemic, uh, you know, got people vaccinated, got those vaccinations going, uh, you know. So uh, I, I just have to say that if you look at the man's accomplishments, you can you can compare them maybe to Lyndon Johnson and Franklin Roosevelt. But I don't see a president in, in the last, uh, you know, in the last century that passed as much in a shorter period of time. And take a look at the jobs report. Inflation's coming down. And they blamed him for inflation. How nonsensical. We come off a pandemic with supply chain shortages, what do you think is going to happen to prices? Of course, supply is down, demand is now high, people are coming out of you know, uh, this pandemic mode, and yes, that's gonna push prices high and gas prices go up. Now they all went down, they, they go down, that's not Biden. They go up, that's Biden's fault, nonsense. I think by the end of the, this election campaign, people will understand better what this man has done. And look, you know, people wanna say, Joe Biden's old, okay. He is old, all right? Trump is old and he's crazy. That's what this vote's going to be about. And I think the American people aren't voting for crazy. So I have every confidence that Joe Biden is going to be reelected. And I think quite, uh, quite substantially, frankly. Thank you so much for your time today, Chair Jacobs.